Okay, welcome everyone to our uh, seminar today. We're really pleased with the turnout and the response here as well as in the live stream. So hi everyone out there in, in the internet. Um, my name is Greg Kim. I'm a corporate lawyer and I've been uh, helping startups for a while now, so for the last 10 years or so. And so um, we're always looking for ways to build up our community. <coughs> we're stuck in the middle of the ocean here and so in some ways we have to try even harder to make things happen here. You know, we're not sitting in, in Mountain View or Silicon Valley and things just happen. So we're all trying to work to make things happen. So I think we have to, you know, try harder. And uh, from a legal standpoint, I know we've been working hard and trying to get lawyers to do the right thing. So hopefully all of you have good experience with lawyers now who know how to do Delaware corporations and they don't charge you an arm and a leg and stuff like that. Um, but 10 years ago, no one thought we could do it. So I think we've improved here. But part of the way we improve is by aligning ourselves with smarter, better people than ourselves. Now, I'm not saying they're, they're smarter naturally, but if you do a thousand IPOs as a lawyer, you're going to be better than me that hasn't done any in the last 10 years because you know, there haven't been IPOs. So it's really a matter of knowledge transfer. And the irony of it is if you do this as a local provider, you actually enhance your value because now you're a friend to these people coming into town and they want to work with you. If you don't do it, they're going to come here anyway, and they're not going to be your friends. So even for the local providers, it's better to do this. Um, and so I've since worked with a lot of mainland firms, Wilson, Sonsini, Fenwick, Cooley, Anderson, Oric, um, to name a few, Pillsbury. And um, you know they like me now because I can help them kind of find good companies. And I tell them, if there's a company you like and you're willing to help them, please take them. That's my standard uh, policy. Um, as it turns out, they never take them completely because they don't want to. They want to be your friend <laughs> if you behave that way. If you tell them to stay out, then they're going to take them and they're not your friend. And then you don't learn, right? Plus, the bottom line is we need to help startup companies reach the end point here. Go public, be acquired with a good exit. If we do that, all ships will rise and everyone will benefit. We're too small a pond right now to be fighting over things. So we really need to grow the ocean and all ships will rise. And if we all have that attitude and spirit, I think we can make it happen. Um, so in some ways, we need to import uh, mainland expertise and connections. At the same time, we need to even be better than the mainland in some ways because we're not going to stick out naturally. We need to make ourselves look as good as we can. So we have to try harder in some ways to, to be good. And I think that's part of the purpose of our panel today. And we, we have some amazing people here, both uh, living here and living on the mainland, who, can, who know public relations uh, for high-tech companies from the standpoint of a Silicon Valley company. And that's kind of where we look to in terms of modeling ourselves, and I think that we need to continue to do that. We do that from law, from venture capital, and we need to do that from a PR communication standpoint. Um, so I'll introduce our moderator, who will then introduce the panel, and they'll introduce them, tell, them, tell you about them. Uh, just a few uh, items, admin-wise. If you have a question, you want to ask it. If you're here, you can raise your hand. Or if you're here or out there on the internet, you can email me and I will uh, put your question on the list. Uh, my email address is Gregory R. Kim at Gmail. Gregory R. Kim at Gmail. Remember to put the R in there because there's another Gregory Kim that will get the email otherwise. <laughs> uh, and secondly, the bathroom keys are on the table outside, so feel free to use them. Um, without further ado, I will turn it over to Cliff Tagawa, who will lead the panel. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Greg. And uh, just a small plug for Greg, because he is the uh, corporate attorney for a startup with, which, uh, in, in which I'm involved. Uh, and he is led by example. I mean, he has been a great resource, not just uh, as corporate counsel, but with introductions uh, to Law, other law firms on the mainland uh, and, uh, and other resources. So uh, it's it's a model that he preaches and uh, uh, acts on. But um, we will start uh, with some introductions. Uh, uh, one of the guidelines. Oh, and I should ask if your cell phone is on. If you could turn it off, I'd appreciate it. Uh, we will do our best to get you out of here on time. Uh, we are saving um, a few minutes at the end of our discussion for questions and answers, as Greg suggested, although he did say if you have a, quote, burning question that can't wait, ask it as, as we go. So uh, we'll keep it uh, as informal as possible. 
But, uh, you know, I'd like each, if you don't mind, each of the panelists, so Lauren, we'll start with you, just to do your 30 to 45 second elevator, elevator pitch about who you are, and then we'll dive in. Okay? Okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Lauren Scher, and I was born and raised here. I went to Penal, and then I went to school in D.C., moved to Silicon Valley, and worked at Electronic Arts, which is a video game publisher and developer. And from there, I kind of got a taste for tech PR. I was doing communications for a video game called The Sims. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with it. Um, and from there, I started kind of getting interested in startups. And now I work with an agency called Launch Squad. And it's a PR firm. And we do kind of, beyond that, we do content, social media, video. Um, but the core of it is, is public relations. And that's my specialty there. We work with high growth emerging companies. We've worked with more than 250 companies since we were founded in 1999. And we are headquartered in San Francisco, which is where I work. Uh, we also have offices in Boston. So some of my clients, um, they range from business software to e-commerce, consumer lifestyle, mobile apps, uh, games. So yeah, um, happy to answer any questions you guys might have. You can find me at the end. Um, thanks for coming. Lori. Lori Taranishi, I am the founder and principal of IQPR. We have offices in San Francisco, uh, New York, and as of 2011, I grew up here as well, went to San Francisco, and um, I am so, so happy to be back in Hawaii. I, even in the traffic, driving down <laughs> to Bishop Street, I, I'm happy, happy, happy to be here for a number of reasons. I mean, there's just so much exciting stuff that I can even know what's going on here. So you guys, you know, I know we're looking to Silicon Valley for lessons, but there is an amazing community here, and you guys are all a part of it, and I'm so happy to be a small part of it, too. Um, my company is uh, made up, I, so I split my time between Honolulu and San Francisco. Um, my company is made up of um, a pretty diverse set of uh, employees. We have diverse clients. We don't just work with startups. We work with corporations, but we also of startups, we like the diversity, um, and we have a diversity of people as well. So we have former attorneys, MPAs, um, you know, uh, USA Today journalists, Reuters journalists. We just hired our newest member, who um, was a director of training at Starwood. So we try to hire people that are smart business people. They don't have to be PR people because we think those are the best people that are going to serve our clients. Um, and today what I hope to provide to you is not just a PR point of view, I definitely hope to provide my perspectives on PR, but I consider myself a startup as well. I was in the warm arms of corporate America for um, many years, and even in the R&D group at Visa, I was a product manager. I mean, I was in PR most of my career, but I was a product manager, and I thought that was hard. <laughs> but um, actually starting your own business is harder even when you start just by yourself. So um, I can hopefully maybe feel a little bit of your pain today and try to um, relate some of my comments up. Hi, I'm Darren Kimura. Um, I guess by my remarks, you're probably going to get that I'm not from the PR world. Uh, I, I represent, I think, more of the uh, startup world. Um, so for the last 20 years, I've been addicted to starting companies. Uh, I started nine of them here in Hawaii, uh, one of which is Energy Industries, which we grew from a Hawaii company to a national energy services company. Uh, I think the company most people probably associate me with now is Sopagee, which is a solar technology company uh, where we use mirrors and we intensify uh, sun heat to create steam. And um, today, uh, to cure my addiction, I'm actually kind of stepping into the world of investing. So on the other hand, now, uh, whereas in, I was in the company building value, now I'm kind of working on companies from the outside and trying to extract value from them. So I think uh, the perspectives I want to share are really that of you know, how PR can be useful for your businesses, why it's useful, and you know, perhaps some tips that you can uh, perhaps use even now along the way. Thanks, guys. So, and inter we'll get to it later. Interestingly, Darren, uh, to his credit, uh, generated a lot of media coverage for so I think some of you might be aware of that. And he did it all without a PR firm. So we want to get to that question. So my my background is in uh, marketing and public relations. I uh, got a company here, Communications Pacific, that 
Uh, my partner and I grew and then we eventually sold to Phil and Knowlton, which is a New York-based public, uh, public relations firm. And uh, subsequently, I went on to run the Asia-Pacific region uh, and did did something similar for a, a, another firm called First and Mars but, uh, While I was living in Asia, I had been back for about 12 years and uh, while not addicted, uh, I did end up start, uh, getting involved with a startup that focuses on uh, interactive television, and uh, that's something uh, which I've been a slave to for the past 12 years. So I can feel your pain, as well as uh, But uh, Greg teed up about seven questions that uh, we'd like the, the panel to, to comment on. We'll kind of go in a round robin uh, way about this, um, and we'll start with, with Lori first. Uh, but you know, we'd, we'd like to hear from everyone on the panel uh, about each uh, question. Um, so for 25 years, I tried to explain to my father-in-law that PR is not a verb, and I failed at that. So he'd always come home and say, so quick, who'd you PR today? <laughs> Lori, what, what's your definition of public relations in PR? And how, how has it changed? Has it changed? I hope most people don't have your father's in the last definition, right. but I did that too. And I guess I can relate, maybe I can relate to a comment Greg made earlier about the, the, the attorney pool improving here because attorneys and peer people were by, by nature defined by the lowest you know common denominators of our profession. <laughs> you guys, the ambulance chasers and you know the flats. But um, we are trying desperately to elevate our function because I really feel like today the practice of PR is more important than it ever has been. And I believe the practice of PR is looking across all the constituents, whether it's employees, which are a lot of startups actually forget about the employees, um, the uh, your investors, your customers, your uh, business partners, regulators, legislators, uh, potential business partners, this whole ecosystem of people and looking at how are you going to communicate with them, how are you going to tell your story, how are you going to differentiate yourself from all of the other players out there. And <clears throat> it's not as simple as you would think, right? And so it's really taking this overall view of all the people that you need to influence to be successful as a startup or as a mature company and determining what your story is to them, how you can communicate that and make sure that your message resonates and that'll change over time. I think that's the hardest thing in a startup environment because your message is kind of changing a lot and you need to always have a core message that you know that tries to, that you try to have consistent no matter what because a lot of things are shifting operationally. Um, as you go along. So I hope that explains it. And then in terms of how it's changed, um, I'd like to comment on that too. Um, when I started, I don't even want to say the year, in the early 90s when I started, it was, PR was pretty straightforward. You know, people viewed it as, I want to get my message out. So we need to send out a press release and we would back then like mail out a kit, you know, and we would mail it to broadcast media, print media, and then you would call them and try to get your story placed. And now, what's happened, and I don't have to tell you this, this is we do not control our brands, right? We don't just launch a website, send out a press release, you know, place an ad, and that is what people think of us. They, people are having conversations all around us, and social media has um, brought that about. So I believe that the practice of PR today is still critically important because it's what your employees are saying as ambassadors to your company, um, it's about creating content that is authentic and real, <coughs> that your employees are putting out, that you are putting out, that people can share. So our job as a PR person is not writing that press release and sending it out like we used to. It is determining with you what your story is, making sure that that message is consistent with what the CEO says, but what, when Darren's company, what his most junior person that got hired two weeks ago was saying. You know, and how are we saying that? It's not a press release only, it's not a website only, it's creating blog content, it's um, 
creating, using data to create statistics that are relevant. I brought a sample, just something that we created um, a couple of weeks ago. It's the anatomy of a data scientist. And it's just a graphic, a picture of a woman. What, what makes a data scientist? Because analytics and big data are so, you know, the topic of the day right now in Silicon Valley. Um, and we get, we got this placed in information week, I mean, a number of, um, technology trades because that's what people are looking for. They're looking for content, pictures, data and pictures. Um, and so anyway, that's a very long explanation, but our role as PR practitioners have shifted because the way information is consumed and shared has shifted as well. As yeah, I agree. I agree with all that. And I think that what Lori said about authenticity is really important. I think that now, especially with the rise of social media, with the rise of content marketing, there's much more of a conversation between brands and consumers. And the media plays a role in that, but the role is much less a, a funnel as much as it is kind of an additional point of conversation. So people are commenting on blog posts in ways that they weren't necessarily engaging before. And so it's important to have a message that is human. It's a voice that's kind of distilling, especially for technology companies. It could be very technical, but you have to have a way of talking about it that is emotional, that is passionate, that is that makes sense to people. And I think that's kind of our role in PR is to make sure that the message is something that people can understand and it's something that people would be interested in reading about um, beyond just getting knowledge. You know, at SOPG, we, we had, it, the messaging is, is critical, and with technology companies, so often are we telling a unique story because we're inventing it, right? We're figuring out a new way for our, our business to do something that no one has ever done before. So in that, you have to figure out, you know, how to tell this very complicated story as easily as possible, how to make that story resonate with your customer, whomever they may be, and, you know, it might be a very niche thing or it might be a massive thing, uh, and do so in an economy of words, you know, and, and that's, a, that's a super tough task to do. I guess the way I've always kind of thought about PR from the way I run businesses and this might sound weird, but I actually start from the end and work backwards. So one, when I think about like a product, uh, what I try to do first is I actually try to kind of write the press release first. And, and I know that sounds really bizarre, but if you can't write a good press release based upon what you think your product is going to be, you're probably going to have a hard time in the market. So the way I kind of thought about that was if the press release has enough kind of zing to it or, you know, was it interesting enough or appealing enough, then, yeah, that's the product I should build because that's the product people will want. So th that's kind of the way I guess I've always thought about it from, from our company standpoint is whenever we're ready to launch a new product or service, I want to start with the end product first, make it something interesting, and then kind of build our way into that. And similarly, it works for me in the business as well. When I think about our businesses, I tend to start with, you know, the end. What is it that I'm trying to do? Raise money? Uh, am I trying to sell a product to a certain level? Great. Understand who the market is. Build a deck, you know, a, a presentation, and then build it backwards, work backwards from there. And, uh, you know, frankly speaking, it's worked out pretty well. Um, it's difficult to do because it requires you to jump, you know, a quantum leap into the future. You know, sometimes that leap could be many, many years. Uh, so it, it really is hard to do with just one person. I don't think this is something just a CEO can do. It has to be done with, you know, CEO, chief technology person, someone from marketing, someone from sales. But you capture all of that together and you can mesh that, that really kind of interesting message in that press release. And then, again, like I said, work it backwards. So here's a data point that we remember, which is uh, Phil and Knowlton, the, the firm that I referenced earlier, uh, when I was running Asia Pacific, uh, it opened the first um, international public relations office in China. It was in Beijing. And as it turned out, there was no word in Mandarin for public relations. So if you go to textbooks, now college textbooks in China, Phil Nolton is credited with inventing 
public relations. <laughs> and you can forget that. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, to, to your point, uh, Darren, you've written that press release. That that's the first thing you've done. So, how can public relations help the start? Yeah, you know, the way I think about that is, as a startup, you're trying to connect to an audience, whatever that audience is. You have a message, a specific message, and you know, me as a CEO, I want that message to be told a certain way. But the reality is, I can't control that, not anymore. Exactly for what Lauren said, you know, the the world takes over. You know, social media, comments, blogs, you know, uh, analysts who write about your product, they kind of begin to own that. That's where press release, uh, I'm sorry, that's where uh, public relations can really help because it's controlling, the way I kind of think about this is like taking dye, putting it into like a bottle of water, drop it in, and you begin to see that dye kind of trickle down that bottle and begin to diffuse and just kind of spread out to the sides. Public relations to me is that bottle. It helps to control that message, kind of keep that liquid dye, you know, kind of dripping down, but within a confined space so that you can still control that message. So I think having good PR allows you to really effectively control that mess, not lose control of it, you know, not, not lose your identity, identity along the way, but really just message to the right audience. And at that bottom of that, you know, that, that bottle, as my example is, it's, it's your investor or it's your customer. So that's the way I've always thought about this. And Lauren, what happens when that bottle of the bottle tips over? And the water spills out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, the thing, the thing with PR is you, you can't, you can't predict what's, what's necessarily going to happen, right? And, and so, the best that we, we try to do is to create that story that, that helps people to understand what, what at its core your company is, right? So, I think that a lot of what we try to do is help companies to define who they are, maybe beyond what they, they think of themselves as. So, we have a company that you know, thinks of themselves as SEO software. It's like, how can we help make that bigger? How can we help make them, you know, more more prominent in the space? So I think a lot of it is is about defining who you are, about defining your story, and then not trying to control too much of what it is and saying, okay, this is our story, this is our messaging. And and not being too upset when when people get it a little bit wrong. Um, yeah, I think it's hard to control. I mean, I respect what you're saying, and I think that's true. Like PR, you are trying to control that message within the, your, to your best ability, but that is true. That we can't control the message anymore fully, and it's it's hard to get sometimes um, any client of ours to understand that that's just the way their game mm -hmm. is, right? So we do have to let go of the control. If you're gonna play, if you're gonna play in the space, you're really gonna play. Then just Know up front that you're going to have a hard time sometimes exactly controlling the message, but that's just life. So if, and if, if I can't control my message, I can run an ad, have complete control. I could just work with a website, my website, and have complete control. Why do I need all the other PR resources that kind of put me at risk? Right, because that's not how people. That's not the way the world is anymore. You know, that's not how people are making buying decisions. Mm -hmm. That's not how investors are deciding which companies to invest in. Right? They're listening to people they know, whether that's online or talking to people. So it's just a fact of life. You know, there's a company that um, I have nothing to do with, but I just noticed, um, and it's it's just the weirdest. It's not. It's a niche kind of product, but it's it, um, the company I think is called Zora. I'm getting that right. Um, and they do like subscription billing so on you know now everybody's buying things through subscription instead of you know um, you know um, and other other ways and so they needed a way to um, come up with you know to break through the clutter and who wants to talk about billing that is like so boring right but they came up with this um, phrase called we're in the subscription economy and they got this all over just you know it's like this is a new way people are consuming media or, or gaming. It's called the subscription economy. And they wrote all kinds of papers on it, articles that they, byline articles that they went to Information Week and all these company uh, publications in place. It's because they redefined the landscape of their industry, right? They came up with a new way to talk about how people are doing things. And because of that, they got their story out and they became positioned as a leader in that subscription building space. 
So that's when we're talking about telling a story like Lauren mentioned, um, or you know, Darren mentioned thinking of the press release first, you have to think about, you know, what is your end goal? Is it to be the leader in the subscription economy? That's what they did. Mm -hmm. And it was highly effective for them. So we as startups, because I've worked with a lot of startups in, in the past, and you know, you're so used to trying to get to market quickly before the other people do. And you're very focused on your product because that's what you do every day. But that's not what a lot of times people want to hear about is like your product. You know, they they want to hear like, how's this going to make my life better? What's different about this? And so you have to kind of take a step back and think about things like the subscription economy. Or I don't know what you said in your press release, but I'm sure it was effective because you, you cut through the clutter. I, I think that's exactly right. So what what I meant was, and I think to your question, when it starts to overflow, you know, that's exactly where those tools, you know, for example, thought leadership pieces, that's exactly where you can begin to kind of pull the message back in. And that's what PR is. It's being able to, you, you want to do this effectively as a strategy in advance so that when that begins to happen, that meaning you lose control, you have the next measure to implement very quickly and again begin to regain control of the situation. But effectively, that's what all that is. PR is a combination of all of those different kind of tools, if you will, which allow you to, to get your message, uh, to make sure that your message hits the right, you know, the right end goal. Yeah, I think I think that point about thought leadership is great because a lot of times we think about PR, we think about a product, we think about an announcement, a launch, um, and and so much of what we do is trying to get companies we work with to think about what is your expertise, what is what can you offer that's beyond your own company, that's thinking about the industry more largely, thinking about trends, thinking about content, and I know Laurie touched upon this as well, it's it's things like this infographic that people are interested in, that media is interested in, and and it's it's a lot about how can you kind of insert your point of view into that and, and talk about your company in a way that isn't necessarily hitting people over the head with your message, but it's it's definitely informing it and, and helping people to understand what you do in a context that is is interesting, um, just more broadly. So, you know, and can I just sorry, mention yeah. something? Because um, what you said, Lauren, I, it just reminded me of something. Intel, and I'm, I'm so sorry, I cannot remember the exact name of it, but Intel launched something recently called like Intel IQ or something like that. Anyway, it's a website, and they just curate content now. It's not even Intel announcements. It's just they're putting, it's a, it's a screen. On your screen, it's a website, and it has like eight, maybe ten different stories that they're putting up there, and it's on topics that, you know, people are talking about, and people can, um, you know, vote on it, and then they'll rate the most interesting topics to people. And it has to do a little bit with Intel's product, you know, Intel's point of view on things, but it's not um, Intel-specific products. So they're just curating conversations and topics so people can go on there and just see what are people talking about in this space. And I just think that's really interesting because that's they're getting it. Right? They're understanding that they can help um, to develop conversations and be seen as an authority or an influencer. Because that's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about right controlling things. We're just talking about having a point of view and influencing conversations. So you know, it reminds me of the, um, the fellow who graduated from college. And he said, you know, four years ago, I couldn't spell engineer. But today, I are one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so but with that in mind, so. I've got a great idea, I, you know, I, I, my startup, uh, great business concept, <clears throat> uh, but I don't know anything about thought leadership or uh, bylined articles or whom to talk to about doing that. Uh, I can barely string together a business plan. Um, or when, when do I turn to a PR shop from, and what, what should I expect? So I think that. PR should be a consideration from the very beginning, whether you're working with a company, a, a PR firm or, or an in-house person or not. I think what Darren said really speaks to a really smart strategy of thinking about PR when you're developing your product and when you're thinking about just your business plan and everything is, is, is there a compelling story here? And I think the earlier you can engage with a PR professional, the better. Um, but understandably, that's, that's not always something that people can budget. But 
I think when you do engage with PR, the most important thing is thinking about story and messaging and how you're going to communicate just the core of what you do. And then beyond that, thought leadership can follow, I think, from, from your story as, as one of the core points of your story. <coughs> what are your opinions about things? And even if you're not you know, a great writer, you still have opinions about the industry that you're in, about how what you're doing is affecting the world in some way. So, for, for instance, if, if I want to hire a public relations uh, person or a firm, you know, if I want to retain a lawyer, I know what to look for. If I want to find an accountant, I know specifically what to look for. What do I look for in a public relations firm? Because what I've heard is, you know, you need good writing skills, but lawyers hiring people who aren't directly involved, but they're very smart. They bring right. another perspective. And that's I know what what our firm looks for when, when we're hiring is primarily good writers mm -hmm. and good thinkers and people who can who can take ideas and turn them into compelling content. And and so I think writing skills are definitely up there and also just relationships. I think that's what a PR firm brings to the table that maybe a CEO wouldn't have is relationships with media and and a knowledge of media relations and also the publications which are constantly changing and, and where to go with what story and for what audience. And so definitely understanding of the media is one, writing skills are one, and also industry expertise because PR for different industries is, is different. And and so just knowing what clients they've worked with in the past I think is, is definitely one thing to look for. You think you can find that I'm sorry, uh, that industry expertise more readily on the mainland, on the West Coast, let's say, than you can with PR firms here in <clears throat> I'm not sure. I think I think it depends on the industry. I, I know that it seems like in Hawaii there's a lot of expertise in, in energy, and I, I would imagine that there there is expertise here for that. Um, I can't really speak to other to other industries here, um, but I, I feel as if you know. There's definitely going to be a difference based on your geography to some extent. I'm not sure what you can tell. There just tons of PR firms in Silicon Valley, right, that specialize in startup PR they're just, because they're just bigger. So there's no question, there's more to choose from there. Um, but I think when you're looking at hiring a PR, you know, embarking on PR, you have to look at, um, just like you would an attorney, right? Like, what, what are you looking for? Because um, there may be certain firms that are really good at placing trade media stories, and that's what you need at that moment, because you need to get to a specific VC audience, and that's what they're reading, right? On the other hand, if you have Series B funding, and you did, were doing your own PR before that, and you are getting ready for your IPO in a year, then you may want to bring on the more blue chip PR firm that knows all the analysts, knows, you know, knows the people that you need to talk to. So it just kind of depends, I think, on your um, your life cycle, what your needs are. Because um, for a lot of people, maybe just hiring a freelancer because you're only doing you know, certain things that you need to get out strategically because you're not really ready with that big story yet, but you still have to announce certain things. That freelancer could be the right choice. So it's, um, you know, it's... it's I'm not really answering the question. I think, but it well, kind of depends. I'm curious. There's a. Okay. Throw so, a question back here. What um what what's the criteria that you're going to use to determine whether you're going to hire an outside? Let's say you decide an APR for some reason. Then whether you're going to hire an outside firm versus do it internally. What's your you know in your checklist for that? Like. You know, I'm, I'm, it depends on the company. So what I was going to say earlier, which I think actually goes in part to addressing this, is I think there's a few ways to, con you know, from the company standpoint, to control your cost. Okay. So I think that if you, as a company, again, this is from the view of the company, if you have a message, you can't expect to hire a PR and they're going to uh, firm to, and they're going to do magic for you. They're not going to come up with your, your unique. It's not going to be aha for you just by hiring a firm. At least that's not what I believe will happen. I think you have to understand what that is, have a way to tell it, and then hire a firm. And as in doing so, they can actually help you to craft that message better or to develop strategies of how to get that message out. So I think that's one of the first uh, misconceptions about hiring PR is that you know I'm going to hire a firm and they're just going to solve all my issues and 
you know, it, it'll be done. It's not, it's not going to be done, and that'll affect your cost. Um, I think almost always do you have to start it internally, meaning that your CEO needs to be a bit markety, or you need to have some people there that can be uh, helpful to, to create that message. To repeat the question? Oh, sorry, for the... Uh, uh, to, to, to repeat the question, I think the question from Evan in the audience was, at what point do you hire external PR? Is that... Or like, what's your, what's your checklist to determine whether you're going to hire external PR, or you're going to do it yourself, or is there a point where the do-it-yourself stops and then you have to hire external PR? Because external PR, I mean, I've seen Ray the same as my lawyer. Um, yeah, so to, to reiterate the question is, you know, at what stage also do you want to hire external PR? So my view on that is you need to know the stage of your company. You need to really know the stage of your company. Everyone in their mind has a stage. But the reality is you're probably not quite there. You, you may have some work to do, whatever it may be. So you need to understand the stage of your company. And if you're early stage raising seed capital, for example, I don't really think that's the right time to hire external PR. Uh, you probably can't afford it, in my view. Um, so you have to do it yourself. I think, though, once you start getting into real venture capital, professional venture capital, Series A, beyond, that's when you start thinking about hiring an outside firm to help you. Now, how much do they help you? You still control. You as a CEO or whoever in the company, you can control that. You can have them do product-specific things, you know, complete corporate brand imaging. I mean, it can be expansive or it can be tiny. It's your call. But it really, to me, comes down to where you are in your business life cycle. I'm just curious, uh, a quick show of hands. How many of you are directly associated with a startup? <laughs> okay. and, and how many of you have public relations as a line item in your budget? <laughs> 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 okay. So to Lori's point on that, I think that there are uh, ways to get into PR. You know, it doesn't mean you immediately go into big firm. You know, you can actually start with, you know, freelancer or maybe a small firm that takes on startup clients. And those firms have startup rates. And as you get past a certain stage, you know, then you graduate into the next group of, you know, next level of PR. And then, you know, that continues to go all the way up to the, you know, the biggest firms. So, Darren, you chose to go it alone to Kevin's question. And at some point, you, you know, you said you start with the, with the press release. You had never written a press release. How, how did you... Figure that out. You know, that's a good question. So, because um, I, I did think about that before coming in here. So, one of the things that my experience at is unique, I think, um, in that we, we did have the mentality to try and go in at it alone. And we tried to learn things on our own. And we made a lot of mistakes. And, and also, it was super expensive. I mean, you're still putting resources and time into learning about this stuff and trying things that could perhaps have been cheaper to hire someone externally. So my perspective today is that of hindsight. I think if I could do it all over again, I probably would have engaged PR, frankly, much, much earlier and put my time and my team's time into doing uh, more value-adding. Uh, not that PR isn't value-adding, but there are other things that come that can be value-adding. <laughs> and, and there are things, for example, intellectual property. <laughs> that's what we do here. <laughs> but, so my, um, to what we did was we actually copied um, the style of big company press releases. And I got to tell you, startup guys, that is not the right way to do it because <laughs> It's not going to hit the right audience. You know, if you look out there and you Google press release, you're going to get companies like GE and really the big companies in America because they're going to be high on SEO, uh, and that's what you're going to find. If you copy and paste that into a Word document and you try to use things like, oh, I'm so honored to blank or whatever, it doesn't really resonate with the audience that you're probably at. And I can tell you that from personal experience. So to, to me, what we did do is we tried to do it that way, and we learned over time that it's not that. You... you, you what you want to do is understand where you are as a company and then find companies similar to you, maybe not in your same industry, but similar to you, and then kind of see what they're doing from a press release standpoint. And once we figured that out, we were able to get much, much more success from an investor standpoint, from a customer standpoint, because we were using terms that were relevant. We were marketing really to the right, the better audience than the, you know, <laughs> the big GE global press release kind of thing. You know, Lori and Lauren's firms are hiring, yeah, so you might want to 
Send your resume. We hire all kinds. I, I could, <laughs> we bring a lot of bad habits. In. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, do we have a burning question here? Oh, I'm sorry. What, what if there's nothing in the industry that is like your product? How do you go about it? I mean, it's a brand new product. It's never been used. Sure. And I, I spent over a hundred thousand dollars, and I'm still. So, so, so could you be sure. The, the question it. is, what happens when you're doing something and you that's never been done before? How do you how do you build a product around that? I think that's kind of a best case scenario. Um, you are announcing something newsworthy if, if it's never been done before, and so I think that. That Darren's point about looking to other companies whom you think have a, have a message that's somehow relevant. It doesn't have to be that they're in the same industry or that they're doing the same thing, but you think that their approach is good. So we do this with our clients sometimes where we're looking kind of at competitors, or we're also looking at companies that are just doing it right, that are, that are reaching an audience with a really authentic voice, and it just helps to read a lot. You know, a lot of my job is going on blogs and just reading what other companies are saying. And that will just help you kind of develop your voice and will help you develop an understanding of the industry from which you can kind of start to tell your own story. And so I think it doesn't have to be about finding a template that works based on other things that have been done before. It's more about what is a good way to tell a story. And the more you read and the more you just kind of understand the space that you're in and other companies that you admire, I think the the easier it becomes to, to put together a press release or, or whatever content you're putting together that, that's telling your story in a, in a compelling way. Yeah, I, I just think, I don't know, yes, that was, that was a great answer. And I was just going back to something, you know, the question that we asked of Darren um, and like doing things on your own versus hiring an agency. And I don't think it's always right to hire an agency. So I'm not saying that, but since I've moved back to Hawaii, and granted, I've been on the mainland. 24 years, so all my friends are still putting me back into the local immersion. You see, it's not working. <laughs> um, but one thing that struck me being back here is that we have a do it yourself mentality in general for everything. My husband does not want to, us to get any kind of help, you know, he rather uh, we do everything by ourselves, wash the car, everything. And I feel like I don't know if that's our plantation mentality, you know, that's how we grew up here. So we just do everything on our own. Um, but like Darren said, that doesn't always work. Like if you're starting a company and like your billing rate is a certain amount and you could be working instead of spending two hours cleaning out your train, like, you know, is that a good use of time and money? And I think you said that in hindsight, maybe it's not. So I'm not here to convince you that you have to hire a PR firm, but I am here to say, you know, look at your time and your team's time. I absolutely think you need to get your management team and all your the critical people in the company that align your message. And you have to know what makes your product the best product out there and why you are going to succeed in the market, absolutely. But once you get that, it, it often makes sense to hire someone. I mean, I, if we do our jobs right, Lauren and I and the rest of the people in our industry, and I, I believe we still have a long way to go in the PR industry, but if we come here maybe 10 years from now, maybe we won't get somebody that says, I pay the PR people the same rate as my lawyers. Because you guys will see that there is value to hiring a PR firm. Because there are many examples of that um, you know, that you can see today of a company that crystallized this message and told the right message at the right time. And that catapulted their value into a whole different category. You know, so there is there is value to it when, when done so look, Lori, on, on that point, maybe uh, part of Evan's question. Let, let's say I buy into all of that. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to go out and hire a PR firm. What do I look for? Um, I think you have to look for who's going to work on your firm, number one. Who's going to work on your firm? Is it people coming in and saying they're going to do things and then they put somebody else on there that you, you know, didn't need ever, even in the pitch, right? So who is going to work on your phone? And are they good? Do they listen? There's a lot of peer people out there that don't listen. You have to be able to have somebody that reads a lot, that can, you guys are so busy every day just trying to do your, get your, make sure your cash flow is, is right, um, getting investors, developing the product, 
we need somebody that's looking out on the landscape what people are saying so that when we do lob a message out there into the marketplace, it's seen and heard and understood and takes hold. So you have to make sure that the person or the people that you hire have that ability to do that. Um, so I don't necessarily think that um, it's the hot PR boutique of the time. I mean, I worked for the Silicon Valley boutique firm in the 90s, the hot one, Cunningham Communications, and there were smart people there. But there were a lot of other smart people that were freelancers that were in other smaller firms. You know, it's not just the hot PR firms that, that are doing that. So you have to look at the individual people that are going to work in the firm. And if it, if it comes down to the individual, why wouldn't I then hire a freelancer? Well, you know, I'm just going to hire so-and-so. You could. I think, if, I think freelancers are great for startups. I absolutely do. For a lot of startups, a freelancer is the best solution. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the thing that's good about a freelancer or a PR firm is that they're doing this every day. They're out in the marketplace talking to reporters. It, it should take them a lot less time to write a press release than you. And if it doesn't, then they're not the right firm for you. Um, they are also talking to analysts, so they, they have analyst relationships. You know, if you go to a partner and analysts and you try to call them up and get them to include you in one of their reports, like, why would they do that? You're not even a subscriber. I know that it's supposed to be all, like, Chinese walls and you don't have to be a subscriber, but there is, you know, there is a little bit of a give and take. So you have to know people that know these analysts that can get you noticed, and, and those relationships take a little time. On the media side, people can tell you all the time, we have these media relationships, and, and you know, that is helpful, but I think reporters right now, they're changing every month. Like, I used to be able to talk to the same banking reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and he'd be like, he was there three, five, ten years. I'm like, I don't need, you know, every six months they're changing, and it's somebody who graduated from college, you know? like. Recently, I mean, not that that's bad, but it's just that they don't even know what happened in the last downturn. So, if you, what you need to look for is not maybe somebody who says they have all these relationships, but are they, do they know media relations? Do they know how to come up with a good story, right? And, and can they convey that story in a way that that public, that meets the needs of that publication's audience so that that reporter will want to take the interview? Yeah, any comment? Uh, no, I think that that's exactly right. I think to your question, it depends on who you're marketing to. So, it, you know, if you're trying to sell a product, I don't think you tell a unique story. My, my view is you don't tell a unique story because consumers are not going to make that leap. You have to tell a story that's, you know, an improvement of something else that they already buy. I hired that's, a company and it cost me $40,000. Not even one call. They put it on the, uh, in the hotels and the television. They put it all over, but it's it's a new way of advertising now. He did it the old way. In uh, now you got Twitter, you got Facebook, and now all of a sudden my business is growing because of that. The blogging, the uh, uh, on on the phone in the van that I drive, it's advertising. <coughs> it cost me less money doing that than when I did. And he meant well. I didn't say that. Uh, he wasn't honest, but this is the point that I wanted to find out. Who do you hire to help you promote your business when it's brand new? I mean, it's going to be new for them, but they have to be more creative. I got a young lady that's got me over 500 hits in two weeks on uh, Facebook. And I'm not paying her that much money, but now I'm recuperating a little bit of what I, I spent before. Yeah. So I need somebody with experience in the modern advertising. So I would respond just two things. I think we should talk about social media because that's a real relevant thing. So we should. I'll come back to that. Um, but with regards to if you're a company and you're looking for PR, what I would recommend is do a bake off. You know, bring a number of different firms in that are at different stages and meet with them. You know, give them your you know, basic deck and tell them, you know, come back to me with some ideas on this date. Meet with them all. You know, see what their ideas are. I mean, you know, at the end of the day, you're the CEO. You're going to have to make a call right or wrong. That's what you do. But the best way to do that is to, you know, get a big sample. And see, I have big business. I'm a caregiver. I went on television.
for free. And I talked to them about how I can help the community. That was easy. I, I knew what I was doing. I've been doing it for 40 years. But when you have a brand new product, how are you going to talk to the media? I mean, I tried to talk to Joe Moore, and he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, you know, did advertise you, it for you. But you, you raise a good point, and, and Darren's right. How, how does uh, your work with clients in terms of media, how has it changed over the past, say, 10 years? I mean, are you calling the Wall Street Journal as often as you used to, Lori, or are you looking at new media, social media? Well, the media, the media has changed. I would say we interact mm -hmm. with the Wall Street Journal almost as much as we did, but not through the same channels. So the Wall Street Journal, if, for those of you who subscribe, has many blogs. They've got a law blog, they've got an economics blog, you know, they have a CTO blog. And so in some ways it's a little easier because if you have these targeted stories that fit into those blog topics, they'll run it. You know, it's 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 more targeted. So um, yes, the way we interact, we, we no longer rely as heavily on those mainline publications only. And I feel like, especially with startups, so much of the time your messages need to be tailored to a specific audience because you're at this really critical inflection point in your development where you just you have to get to this universe of people. You know, I mean, we try to look at it like, what are your goals? So, you know, sometimes we look at the startup in LA. It's an amazing company. They've been working for 20 years. Okay, it's a 20-year startup. <laughs> life sciences company. Okay, they're a life sciences company. They're they're developing a sickle cell drug. And these people are amazing people. The, the founder's a doctor. He actually went to school in Hawaii, and um, they have funded their company through private funding for 20 years, and are bringing are in phase three FDA trials. It's it's phenomenal. When do you ever hear? That kind of story. I mean, life sciences companies, right? It takes a lot of money, um, and you know, we. Um, one of the things we did was we went to this doctor's um, alumni publications, Harvard, Loma Linda Medical School, you know, and um, placed articles in these journals because that's where he was getting funding. So, you know. You kind of got to look, you have to be creative and not just think about, hey, I'm going to the Wall Street Journal because the Wall Street Journal, that's going to pay off for me. I mean, it can. Everyone wants to get into the Wall Street Journal, but sometimes for specific things, an article in your university's glossy magazine, Stanford magazine, that reaches an amazing audience, right? So we placed articles in Stanford magazine and, and it's very helpful. And, and Lauren, and with your clients, in terms of the media equation, if you will, where, where does social media fit? It really depends on the client, I think. But it's a part of our strategy no matter what, whether it's a part of our program. Sometimes the scope of what we do changes depending on the client. Some we, we do have a dedicated social media program, and others we're kind of acting more as, as consultants, and we're not really developing that content for them. But I think it's just it's so important now that your marketing, your PR, your social media are all integrated. You can't have them in silos. And and so we want to make sure whenever we're engaging with a company on the PR side, like we ask, you know, what are you doing on social media? And a lot of times the answer is nothing. Or we have we have a Twitter like account, but we never tweet. And so it's it's just kind of understanding what kind of content would people want to want to read on on um, on your company's Twitter account and how can that work with your marketing and your PR. So I would say that we always we always recommend that the companies pay attention to social media, but certain ones like gaming companies, you know, it's social media is super important. You know, their fans are rabid and they really want content all the time. So in that case it's something that, you know, they have a dedicated social media person and they're pumping out, you know, everything on Facebook and Twitter. And then for others, you know, some of our B2B clients, it's it's a little bit it's less about you know just having constant content and it's more about strategically making announcements, following the right people on Twitter, having conversations mm -hmm. with other influencers. And so the strategy is going to be very different depending on the company. But in all cases, social media is is a critical part of what we're doing, um, regardless of whether we're the people who are actually doing it on the on the PR firm side. So so I've taken Lori's advice and I'm going to hire a PR firm. <laughs> I've done what Darren has said. You know I've got this bake off put together and. 
looking at uh, different firms, um, maybe the question that's floating around out there is, how much is this going to cost? And I've got, you know, I've got one firm that's charging law firm rates, another that uh, my, my, my niece who's just out of college is going to do it for minimum wage. Um, there's a retainer, there's hourly. Uh, someone else is saying, hey, I'll take some equity if you don't have a budget. How do I make sense of that? And I'm looking at Lori. I'm, look, I'm looking down. <laughs> I learned that. I've heard your case. You know, um, yeah, I mean, there, you know, there's different models. You know, I when we work with startups, a lot of times we'll just we like to work on an hourly rate because if you set a retainer and you know they the startup thinks they're ready, but they're not, then you know you run into situations where you don't do a lot, and then you know there's just people feeling like, oh, what value are we getting? Or we're trying to you know, we feel bad, so we try to come up with ideas, but they're not really helpful at that juncture. Um, so to me, it's better to kind of go on an hourly rate in terms of the billing structure. Um, but if, you, if you're not sure, you know, then it, 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 that seems to be a better way. In terms of equity, um, we have taken equity for um, on a very selective basis. My dad always tells me, you know, can't eat equity, and that's right. So, um, you know, we are a business too, and I think in in every part of your life, right, when you embark upon a relationship, you know, both sides have to feel the bone of that relationship, and we really try to do that. It's not, it shouldn't be adversarial with your PR people. Your PR people should be a trusted advisor, but you should feel extremely comfortable, and you should be able to you know, tell them almost anything because they are looking out for you. They, you are, they are hired by you to look out for your brand and what people think of your company. And I think that is a huge trust that you give to us. And we take it very seriously. Um, and so in some cases, we do take equity. And if we think that, you know, it makes sense, um, and it's a way for us to show that we're committed to, and not that to say that for the companies we don't take equity and we don't trust or we don't think we're going to make it. It's just that you know it just kind of depends on each situation. Laura, I think to echo what Laura said um, about equity being being very selective in that case, uh, it's not unheard of. But in most cases, I know our company uh, we go monthly, and it's not it's not a contract that's you know years and years, but I think it's something like 45 days notice. Um, and we tend to we tend to work with companies more in the long term. So we like to engage with companies over, over the course of years rather than months because we think that it's it's great to build that relationship and also to have you know kind of ongoing work that's going on day to day. And I think what Lori said, you know, it's it's tough when the companies aren't necessarily ready because you don't want to run into that case where you're paying a bunch of money and your PR firm's like, hey, we want to help you, but you have nothing to talk about. So I think a lot of it is is making sure that your company, that you're dedicating the time to work with your PR company to make it worth it, you know, so that you have somebody who's, you're having regular meetings, you're having regular brainstorming sessions, that you're keeping your firm up to, you know, up to speed on what's going on so that they can, they can, you know, make the most of what, what they're doing for you. So a lot of it is, Making sure you're invested as well, and that you know you're paying money, but you're also dedicating your time and your resources. Um, and that's not always the case with, with companies that are really early stage. I think they you need to dedicate your resources elsewhere sometimes. So, question? Yes, sir. Uh, in the previous business, I I looked at advertising dollars from the standpoint of how much it's going to bring back. To and had a rule of thumb that for every dollar I spend, I should get five dollars back. Is there a similar kind of a numeric uh, that we can think about? So we're, the question is return on my, my PR yeah, yeah, I think the question is ROI. Um, that's, yeah, that's always um, something that I think the industry in general um, is trying to do a better job of capturing what that ROI is. Um, we have gotten much more sophisticated at um, developing analytic tools to track um, the, the return on our program. So um, for one client, we uh, track quarterly um, shifts in 
uh, share a voice <laughs> in tonality of coverage, you know, um, where, uh, uh, where um, their voice, you know, where, where their point of view is heard. And then in the social media area, just tracking, um, you know, what the conversations were and was this client actively engaged and, and positive or negative tonality of coverage, right? And can we equate that for sure to increases in revenue or share price? I mean, we, we try to make um, correlations, but they're not always clean because we talk to so many different audiences and there are all these other things happening in front of them. But there have been campaigns where I've been involved in which are geographic in nature, so we were able to show that we went into a market and we did this campaign and it got this, these results. And when you see data like that, you really start to appreciate the value that PR can have. And especially, um, you mentioned social media. I mean, it is amazing to me today what you can do with a well-crafted social media campaign. Um, it can help you, it can, um, it can help you change uh, the overall perception of the company in, in great ways. And on the crisis side, too. You know, one thing we haven't talked about and every business eventually faces is crisis. And, you know, having a PR strategy in place um, when you have a big issue, um, that's, that's also critically important as well. And that's when a lot of times companies are willing immediately to pick up the phone and hire a PR firm because their stock price is going to go down tomorrow when the story breaks, right? Um, so if we're good in the crises, and you're going to hire a PR firm and pay this money in a crisis, we should be good the other way, right? To help you really catapult yourself into uh, on, the, on the positive side. So really, anyway, that's all I'll say about that. So to next question, Jeremy. Yeah. yeah. And, and so within SOGG, how are you gauging success or, or not? It's it's hard. So I think I think of that question in two ways. One way is you know customers, and one way is the investors. Um, it's difficult to gauge either. There's not a direct uh, metric that I was able to ever come up with to, you know, say if I put another dollar more into PR, I'll get five dollars back in revenue. But, um, and I think Laurie did a good job of explaining the customer side. From, from my standpoint, the there's a there, especially if you're raising capital as startups do in technology, there's a there's a huge bump in valuation when you have good PR, uh, a good PR campaign. Uh, in front of you. So in other words, if you're going out to raise capital and you have a good PR campaign out there, there's positive uh, discussion about your, your business, you'll see that on the valuation. And what that does, it doesn't necessarily translate back to you in dollars yet, but what it does translate back to you is a smaller amount of liquidation, uh, dilution, meaning that the higher the valuation, same amount of dollars coming in from the investor means that they own a little bit less of the company, but they're willing to pay a little bit more for it because they see the company as being hot or cool or whatever it is. I think I saw a question in the back. Sure. Okay, so if you're if you're a let's say a high tech startup and you want to do three three things that you would do for like guerrilla marketing, it could be PR, it could be something else, what would be those three things that you guys would do? Or would recommend that they Okay. So there are some we should all take one. Yeah. Yeah. question. Oh, um, what are the three guerrilla marketing or PR tactics you would do as a startup, right? So Darren said we all have to take one. Yeah. I think. <laughs> or you can take one. I, I, I'm not going to take one. I'll take one. Um, so I think, I, of course, it depends on, on what, what you're trying to achieve and what your company is. But I think sometimes we struggle with, um, with companies who, they don't have anything to really announce yet. Maybe they're, you know, still in soft mode. Maybe they their product isn't ready, but they still want PR. So then, what do what do you do at that point? And I think we've already talked about thought leadership, but I think it's a great thing. And so a lot of what we do is develop bylines. And I think that's a great way to get your voice heard and not invest a whole lot in a widespread PR campaign that requires, you know, putting together an entire press release around a product that you're not ready to announce. So. We had one company, and it was it was another gaming company, and they weren't ready to announce yet, but they still wanted people to know who they were. They wanted to know who the founder was when they were going to announce. She'd never done anything before. She was just like, I'm new. I'm starting, trying to start a company. So we're like, OK, let's get you in Venture Beat. Let's talk about what you learned from the circus. She was a circus performer. 
um, and how it applies to game development. And she's like, okay, great. Like, these are the five things I learned uh, in the circus, and this is how it helped me start my company. And we wrote this byline, and we placed it in Metrobee, and we got a good response. And I think when, when you don't have, you know, it doesn't have to be about your product. It can be about just who you are as a founder and how that can help other people, especially for publications like trade publications where other people are reading who are, who are also founders who are also trying to start companies. Just if you can share your knowledge in a way that's interesting and in a way that, that grabs people's attention, um, it's a great way to, to kind of elevate your story and, and set the groundwork for, for a PR campaign online. And I think that was a great example, you know, just finding some unique quality and and do campaign around it. Um, I think if you can make your founder um, or another senior person with the founder is best, and this is, goes back to the example Lauren gave, your chief spokesperson, I think, and, and that person's willing to do it, they're media trained, um, or they're just good at it, because I <laughs> assume that you didn't get media trained before you went out there. Um, since you're doing everything by yourself, <laughs> media training yourself, which is great. I mean, I actually, I respect that so much. It's so hard to do. Um, but I think choosing a spokesperson and build, and when you're small, you know, it's just having that consistent person out there because everything now is SEO driven. If you can associate that founder's name with the company and get it, you know, get that story together and then you repeat it. Um, I think that's a very helpful thing. And, you know, we can do all kinds of tools around it. This person can um, can comment on things. They can, you know, we, um, we work for a little larger company, but they wanted to um, get more <coughs> coverage in this in fraud, in just the area of fraud, insurance fraud, banking fraud. So we um, we called this person, this was not their real title, but we called them fraud chief. And we got very, very successful in getting um, high-level media placements because it was this fraud chief commenting uh, on different fraud trends. So that's, you know, there, there are different things you can do like that that help you to sell this person to the media in an easier, more consumable. So to me, I, I think uh, what I would do is I would promote the vision, the big vision, meaning, you know, I'm going to save the world because of X, you know, my product does X, the big vision, and then talk about the cool culture of the company. Because, you know, really at that, if, if we're talking early stage of the business, that's really kind of all you have. You, you may not even have a product in, you know, beta yet. So what you do have is you have a bunch of smart people that are willing to work super hard for this really incredible vision and you're going to save the world. So it's, it's figuring out a way to tell that story. Now, how do you tell that story? So that would go down to things such as really, you know, maximizing social media, because it's relatively cheap or if not free in some cases, you know, put up WordPress websites, you know, generate your own blogs, get your thought leadership going, you know, pretty much do all that kind of stuff at night and just push it all out as hard and as fast as you possibly can for, you know, three months or something like that. And also just this PR orientation that you guys are talking about getting your message out here. I mean, I would say, you know, just think like that. Think in a, in a PR way. <laughs> as you go through your daily life. You know, um, when I started my company, my dad told me you have to spend 25% of your time marketing. And I thought, how oh, am I going to spend 25% of my time marketing? I have to like eat, you know, to do work. <laughs> but I tried to do that as much as possible. I just go to lunch every day, try to go to lunch with someone, or have coffee with someone, um, just to expand my network of people. You know, I still feel like I'm very, even though I've been, I, before I moved back to Hawaii in 2011, I started doing work in Hawaii, so I, I would go to the office and I'd go back once or twice a month here um, from California. So just starting to build that network. Um, and it's hard, like you're just so tired, you're working, you know, 15 hours. I don't know how many you guys are probably working 15, 20 hours a day, but you have to force yourself to do that, I think, because you never know when somebody you know is going to know this reporter or someone you know is going to know this investor or someone you know is going to know this analyst. I mean, it's just, it's amazing to me. I just met somebody yesterday on that had worked with um, someone I knew at Visa and made that connection. And, you know, it's just, it, it all helps. And you just don't know when that, that person you meet is going to help your company or your business or that you can connect them with somebody else. So I think taking that approach is good. And actually, that is where a PR firm like Lawrence that is in Silicon Valley, they know venture capitalists, you know, we know people that are part of the ecosystem that are a little harder to keep ties to when you're here in Hawaii. 
So that is a value that I think that you guys can bring, right, to to companies that um, have that that's the investment you make in a PR firm because they are in the ecosystem every day cultivating those relationships. But there's no way that we avoid we can cultivate to on a daily basis, right? So you know, it's a, it's an interesting point about the role of the founder in a media campaign. Uh, I'm looking at Shinora Farnsworth because she helped me write the original business plan for uh, our startup. But so many times as uh, I was out there raising money initially, I had, you know, it's on Cliff, here's a check, but you need to know it's an interesting business model, but we're really investing in you, the founder. And uh, I don't know, Shinora, you've counseled a lot of companies. I mean, that is fairly yeah. common, I think. Yeah. And still the way we make decisions today. <laughs> so, uh, where, what's the founder's role in terms of a media strategy? If you don't, if you're not ready to go to market with the product, mm -hmm. <coughs> I think the founder's critical. I mean, it's it's critical, and we're mm -hmm. also selecting whether we're going to engage with them from a PR firm sure. standpoint. And you need to make sure that your CEO is your or your your founder is your chief storyteller, and that person's buying into the message, and that person is involved. In developing your messaging, your positioning, you're not, and it's not delegated to another person who, you know, is going to try to be the, the spokesperson, and that person is not. You need to have your CEO be, be the face of your company and the voice of your company, and that requires work and time. And I think that, that that's kind of a challenge um, if we talk about kind of some some pitfalls for for startups doing PR. I think it's is that the CEO or the founder is too busy to do it. And, and that can't be the case, I think, because really the founder is, is, the, is the person you want to have talking to reporters doing interviews, if at all possible. It's the person that you want to have you know, attributing bylines to. And, and that requires a lot of collaboration. So we, we tend to think, we tend to try to, to set that expectation as, as early as possible when we're engaging with the company saying, and the founder has to be involved. Um, so how does it work? You know, uh, okay, I hear what you're saying, but you know, it's not how I was raised. I'm really not comfortable in front of a reporter, much less in front of a camera. Uh, I, I don't know what to say. I get stage fright. Uh, you know, my family values were such. So we don't. Our name's not out there. We're behind the scenes. You hear a lot of that in Hawaii. What do I? What do I do? How do you prepare something? Right. We do, we do a lot of media training, and a lot of times um, people are not, most people are not super comfortable, you know, being in front of a camera, speaking publicly, doing interviews with strangers who are asking them really appropriate questions, and so we just try to be as exhaustive as possible in doing mock interviews and providing as much background as possible into publications and reporters whenever we set up interviews, mm -hmm. just preparing messaging and talking points and frequently asked questions. I think it's all about just providing as much information as we can and and then providing kind of helpful general tips about, you know, public speaking in general. But a lot of it is just being prepared for individual engagement. So you're going to get on the phone with an analyst, like, this is what you need to know about this analyst. Um, or you're going to get on the phone with, with so-and-so. Just we do a lot of research and a lot of working one-on-one -on -one with spokespeople to make sure that they just feel like we We've given them everything that they need to know in order to be successful in the interview. Lori, I just feel like if you're going to be a startup, then you better you have to get over it. Like, I don't care. <laughs> like you, you know, like I don't care. Like I know I kind of grew up in that environment too, and you know I had to be deprogrammed at Visa because they made me see an executive coach who was like apologizing too much. And, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like I don't know what I was. I was just not forceful enough. You know, and um. I've learned, and I get it. Like in every culture, you have to change a little bit. Like in, in Hawaii, I don't it's not as frontal maybe as I when I go to California. I got to switch my brain a little bit, and you, you guys probably do too. But then when I come back, I, I switch my brain again. But but here in Hawaii, we have to get over it because you know what? If you don't do it, somebody else is going to take your space. And so, just if you're going to be a startup, if you're going to do it, then just do it. You know, and, and switch your mind and tell yourself, I don't care, I have to, this is for the health of my company. My employees are relying on me 
to be this voice. And I have to get my, I, I cannot echo enough what Darren said about, you've got to get your employee culture aligned. If you don't have that, then you are going to struggle even as your company grows. Because nobody is going to know what the vision and the message is. They are your strongest assets, your employees. They are your strongest assets. So you have to get everybody into this communications culture. So if they see you going out and making connections, they see you talking to media, they know that that's important. They know the story of the company is important, and it becomes part of your DNA, just like developing your product is. And um, I really see it. I've seen it happen so many times when a company does that, and they have that orientation. Your chances for success, I really believe, it's like the silent killer. When you don't spend, you know, pay attention to PR, everybody knows, okay, if I don't follow this SEC filing, if I don't do my AK, I am going to get a fine, and that is going to make our investors shaky. But, you know, if you don't do anything with PR, it's like, it is, a silent killer. Like, nothing immediate happens, right? But 10 months down the road, there might be another company that was out there every day saying their message, and they will overtake you. So, you know, you have to, you have to think about these things. So Darren, I think you were born in front of a camera doing an interview. <laughs> but it, it, it seems to come quite naturally to you, but how, how, how did you prepare? You know, I think, uh, so that's what that's what people think because I do it so much, but I think it just comes down to a lot of practice. Uh, you know, I grew up in a traditional local family as well, and they don't like to really get out there and make bold statements, and that was my upbringing as well. Um, but, you know, I wanted my company to be successful, and someone had to do it, and that was my job. So I just got out there and did it. And if you Google me and go all the way back in time, you'll see the very early stuff was very, very bad. <laughs> very bad, embarrassingly bad. Um, but you get better every time you do it. And I think that there is a right way to to do it, uh, where you can, you know, cut your teeth on some maybe not as risky things, and you know, progress along the way to the point where you can get up to national media, for example. So. It just it, you just have to practice. You practice, you get comfortable, it becomes muscle memory, you get out there, you do it, it's natural, you get better every time. And sometimes, you know, when you have bad interviews, you know those are the best <laughs> ones because you remember those lessons um, the most. So, you know, it's just practice. But but I do have another uh, view on the first point though. I, I do think though the founder is super important to be your spokesperson, but if not your founder, because some founders just aren't gonna be that person. Mm -hmm. And it, it is what it is, and you won't ever change that person. Then you know it's the CEO, but if it's not the CEO, you can still make it work with someone else who's in leadership in your company, but give that person the authority to be your culture keeper. And I'll give you an example of that. You know Macintosh, right? So Apple is out there. You got you know uh, Steve Jobs and Wozniak. They started the company. They launched Mac. Mac was floundering. Uh, they brought in Guy Kawasaki to be the chief evangelist. And that's what he did. That was his job. And you know the rest is history. He did a phenomenal job messaging that. And that was that was really his skill. He loved to be promoting that product. And I think that um, you you can still find those people within our companies because the reality is you know people are built. You can change some people, but you're not going to change them all. And you know some people will just never ever ever want to be in front of a camera. But he had the backing of the founder, right? Like of that, course. that was defined as an important part of the it's a job. Yeah. 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 You need to have that support and that needs to be a job. Absolutely. Yeah. And we have we have some cases where we'll kind of we'll have multiple spokespeople and they'll serve different functions. So hey to use a ton of gaming examples, but one company, they um, they have two twin brothers who are the founders and they're the CTO and the creative director, and then the CEO. So for corporate stories, we'll go to the CEO and he'll comment about the vision of the company. Whenever we have questions about development, about art, about just gaming enthusiasts who want to talk to somebody who's really nerdy about games, we'll go to one of the twin brothers and they'll talk, you know, with so much passion about what they do. Mm -hmm. And and that's kind of a good way for us to, to also make sure that there's enough resources to go around in terms of we're not, you know, when it's crazy crunch development time, we're not tapping the CTO. Um, to do stories, but it's also a great way to just kind of like build up our arsenal and have and have people. But you, at the same time, you want to balance. You know, you, everyone can't be a spokesperson, but if you do have you know multiple people who are good at it and who have something to say, um, I think you can kind of assign um, some kind of roles. 
you can, you can also take that team, or not team, I guess you can say team approach, but use that um, to your advantage. Like we um, helped a, a technology company, an analytics company, launch a blog. And, you know, there's no way you can get one person to write it. And, you know, we help on some of the posts, but what they've done is um, they've selected certain people and they do, you know, they all contribute. And if everybody does, you know, one blog post a week and we have multiple people, um, it, it does help in that regard too. And it allows the company to leverage people that don't like, you know, don't always like to be in front of the camera, still do, um, still participate, mm -hmm. right? Because like Aaron said, some people just are never going to be in front of the camera, but they are excellent writers mm -hmm. and they have excellent points of view. Uh, several questions. Uh, over here, please. Yeah. So what's the big, basic difference between PR and advertising? And if I want to develop an advertising campaign, would a PR firm help me with that, or do I need to go to like an advertising agency? Yeah. Yeah. So the question is, uh, what is the difference between PR and advertising? And if you want to create an ad campaign, do you have to go to an ad agency or PR agency? And um, again, that depends, because um, a lot of, as we're seeing social media kind of blur the lines between everything, we're seeing um, many organizations, many PR firms sort of become advertising firms. I mean, we're going to be rebranding our company because we don't, we're doing so much content creation now, we're not just doing PR, right? So um, we do buy ads for our clients. Um, but the difference, between, to answer your original question, the difference between PR and advertising is advertising is when you buy space, you control that full page ad or that half page ad and you can say whatever you want in that ad. And you know, that is effective in some, Areas, right? If you're launching a new product and you have to get out to a certain audience, advertising should be a part of the overall mix of marketing and PR. Um, social media should be part of the mix. Um, but, you know, we also believe that communications has a role to play. And I think um, one thing that's being talked a lot about in our industry, in the PR industry, and in marketing is what is going to happen to the functions of marketing? and PR within an organization. And I'm talking about larger organizations, because in startups you usually have one person at that managing marketing and PR. But in larger corporations, um, you've got a marketing, you know, marketing organization that has advertising, promotions, sponsorships in one silo. You've got PR, and that often has investor relations, although sometimes investor relations is in finance, but investor relations, public affairs, product PR, and corporate PR in one silo. And social media is sometimes in PR and then sometimes in marketing. And what's happening with social media is it's just running through all those functions. And so nobody knows like who really owns PR. Because the marketing people are using the channel to sell their product. And the PR people are using it to manage the bad customer complaints or you know manage the, the brand overall. And um, I think I don't know what's going to happen in 10 years because a lot of the support agencies like ours were morphing with the change that social media has brought. But um, we, in our industry, the holy grail, and Cliff knows this, in the 80s, they were talking about the concept of integrated yeah, communications. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I was there in the, in the 80s and 90s, right? <laughs> Sorry, Cliff. Um, but right, I mean, it's been talked about for a good 20, 30 years. And it's it hasn't ever happened. And so I think what's going to happen is it's going to, social media is going to force that integration and you're going to see better decisions being made by companies because these functional areas are coming together and it's not the advertising people saying, you know, we want to hold on to our ad budget, so we're going to do this campaign and it's completely disconnected from <coughs> the PR people and what they're doing in social media and in media pitching to launch the campaign. I don't know. You know your so the, true, true or false, I can go to a PR firm in general, I can go to a public relations firm, and get some advertising support, but I can't, usually can't go to an advertising agency and get public relations support. That's not totally true. I mean, it's it depends. So advertising agencies are getting to PR too. I see them. I see them hiring PR people. Um, but, but the one thing I will say is look at the core. Look at the core of what their services are. You can tell on most companies' websites. They'll say, we can do all these things. But you just you generally know what their core strength is, right? And we do the advertising just because there are a few of our clients that need us to be able to do those kinds of things. But we, I would not say that our firm is an advertising agency, right? So, so but to the gentleman's question, I really don't know 
what I know I need some kind of help, but I don't, don't know exactly. And here's a firm that says it's a full service marketing services firm versus a PR firm or a freelancer who specializes. How do I figure that out? Are you asking me? Or I feel like I'm part of the conversation. <laughs> Darren, well, <laughs> Well, I, uh, my view as, as a CEO is the PR I would outsource, the ad stuff I would do in-house. That's just the way I think about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, <laughs> I think that tends to be the case of how a lot of the companies we work with, they have in-house marketing, and they, they develop a lot of their own programs and they handle advertising, and we kind of consult on that, but primarily what we're doing is PR, and it's integrated with that as much as possible, but um, generally the the marketing team is in-house, and they're handling it as I said. Okay. Uh, another question? Or not? Uh, well, I have a question from the cyberspace group. Right? Um, Two-part question from John is, are there any do-it-yourself resources for folks to learn about how to do PR, uh, like blogs or websites? That's one area. And then the other is, um, are there any certifications for PR folks, especially related to social media, that buyers can kind of look to? Do I need to repeat that one? Great. Sure, I think I said about it. Okay. Um, there are tons of oh, well, there are tons of PR resources out there. I mean, just Google, you know, um, Google it, and you'll be able to find um, PRSA is a Public Relations Society of America. They have a number of just I think general tips on PR. Um, and there are many, many blogs out there um, that can give you some, some help. And I believe there are a number of entrepreneur um, websites and blogs that help start up companies. And PR is kind of a component of some of the advice that they give. Um, what was the second part of the so, question? So, 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 uh, in terms of certifications, PRSA, IABC, I think they, I know PRSA, there's um, something called uh, APR, accredited public relations, something APR, that's a, a PR designation. Um, but I don't, I've don't. i not seen any social media certifications, but you, well, not, not that I'm aware of. And I think more and more it becomes just kind of a part of, of what how we live our lives. You know, social media crosses <coughs> the boundaries of what we do personally for business and and I think for my generation is it's we kind of just grew up with it and and I think to have a certification it, it's kind of a lot of it becomes kind of almost common sense and and so I think there might be kind of a generational gap there where there's some people who, who feel like they just got it with, with social media and and there's some people who, who feel like they need to need to learn kind of officially how to um, how to do social media but it's such an amorphous Thing that it's, I think it's very hard to teach the rules of social media, especially because there's so many stakeholders. And so I think a lot of it becomes kind of trial and error of using it. Um, just being on Twitter, I mean, I just have Twitter up all day. And um, that's, I think that's the best way to do it. It's not to, to go to a class, it's to see how people are using these tools. And, and, and if, you know, for more structure, I think to see case studies of companies that have been successful. Um, using social media for particular campaigns. Pacific New Media is offering a social media certification at UH. Oh, nice. I've, I've seen that they have. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, more geared towards business, yeah. like business metrics, you know, KPIs, how you do certain mm -hmm. things, blogging for business, that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, that's great. I think it would be there's, great. There's quite a few entrepreneurs out there teaching people like me how to do it. If there's any questions here. Mm -hmm. More of a comment. <clears throat> As a CEO of my company and the inventor and the founder, I don't have time for social media. I don't have time to spend all day on it. I don't have time to learn rules. So how do we accomplish this? If it's going if I understand that really what social media is really doing is it's changing that, that the dynamics of media from the standpoint of a group situation to a one on one situation. It's like being next door and talking to your next door neighbor. I see the value of that, but as a CEO, I don't have the time to do that. I'm on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and all of that, but I never look at it because I just don't have time. So is your question how to, how to deal with them? Yeah, how do you deal with them? Yeah, I mean, to me, you just have to put someone on your staff to do it. You have a company of one, what do you do? Then you're going to have to do it, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> 
to do that because I'm not like him. I'm not that the busy, but I can write work the guy. I am not that creative. And this young girl has really come up with, uh, I gave her a sample of the product, and she loved it. And all you need to do is, I give her so many hours a week because that's all like my budget is. And she's, you know, just blown everything so out of proportion, so wonderful. It's something I could not do. It was one. I'm the only person in my company, but I found someone to uh, reasonable, not too expensive. I'm going to suggest that that UH certificate requires every student that gets certified to have a project. Mm -hmm. So maybe some of your companies could hire one of those students yeah. to be, and that would be their project, and they would do your social media campaign for you as part of their earning their certificate. Uh, yes, sir. Do you have a personal blog? We don't. A personal, a personal me personally, yes. I don't. Um, Why not? <laughs> I honestly, I honestly don't have time to blog. Um, I just, doing it for other people. Though. Yeah, <laughs> I, and also, yeah, I, I feel like I spend my, my whole day writing. Um, and when I get home, I don't really want to write just for myself. Um, mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I think it's very valuable. And I mean, I wish I, I wish I had time to do it. Um, and I, I think it's also, you know, where your interests lie, you know. For some people, it's, I, I find that other forms of social media, I find more engaging, and I can have more conversations than I would on a blog. I think if it's something like Facebook or Twitter or even LinkedIn is more conducive for me to have conversations with people than a blog where people are commenting. Um, but I know that that, you know. But some people think differently. A blog is a commitment, right? Like if you're going to do a blog and only like put something up there once a week, then I just wouldn't do it. That's why I, I don't do it. Because I, I, I just know that I wouldn't do it well. Um, and so I'd rather not do it. But you know, there are other forms of communication that will insult and more valuable. But you know, everything you just have to make time for, right? So you have to decide how much of your time you can allocate. And maybe you can start small. And just make two hours a week, you know, for this. But when you start to see returns on that, you know, maybe it'll encourage you to do more. So on, on that note, uh, I want to make sure there's enough time for Q and A and small group uh, interaction. We, we've talked a lot about how to succeed with uh, public relations, what to do. Uh, real quickly, what are some of the pitfalls? And Darren, how many times did you? Definitely. Oh, a lot. So the pitfalls, you could do it wrong, you know, send the wrong message, you could, you know, just, I mean, everything could go wrong, you know, just <laughs> swear on TV. I mean, you could do any, <laughs> any one of these things. Uh, not that I've done that, but um, you certainly have done things that are mistakes too in this world. So there's a lot that can happen. Is that from lack of preparation? I think being nervous has, um, yes, yeah, so preparation helps to overcome some of the nervousness. A lot of practice. Um, uh, will help you get better at it. Um, you know, being knowledgeable about your content is also really important too, because um, I can tell you in the early days of what we did, uh, you know, I didn't really know all the answers. So when you get asked a question, you know, especially in a media situation, you don't kind of want to sit there and say, I don't know. So, you know, that tends to get you in trouble as well when you try to step outside of your area of expertise. But you can get, you can learn ways to get around that through practice and through training. I think you know, coaching will help you to sidestep questions like I've done today. That's something you said. <laughs> you know, so better. Yeah, let's see. Let's get a couple practice. I, I think what what Darren said about not wanting to say I don't know. I think that it's it really important to be able to say I don't know or let me let me get the answer for you. You know, I'll come back to you with that or I know somebody who might know better. Than me, I think um, a lot of times I've, I've listened in on interviews where, where CEOs, you know, are kind of floundering, and, um, and of course you don't want to say I don't know, but um, I think it's just important to be, as a spokesperson, to be honest and transparent as much as possible. And um, and when you when you let ego get in the way, I think that is very apparent, um, and so I think that can be a pitfall. Good, Lori, last thought. Um, I think the preparation is the key. It's, you know, if you were going to go into a deposition, you wouldn't go into a deposition without having your attorney prep you, right? So mm -hmm. you should not go into an interview 
um, without reading your briefing document. And if you have a good PR person there, going to do a good briefing document for you. It can just be a page. You just say, what is the publication? Who is their audience? Who are you talking to? What are the five questions they're going to ask you? So you can think about it before. So that when they ask you, well, how come you haven't gotten your funding? You got funded like two years ago. And and things happen. Like, are you doing bankrupt? You know, things like that. Then you know how you're gonna, what you're gonna say in that question. So preparation to me is, um, you know, the most important thing. Paying attention to it and just not displaying for it. Because I, I truly believe I've been doing this a long time. It really can make the difference in the success or failure of your of your enterprise. I believe that, um, and not just because I'm a PR person. Because um, I I was on the product side. I was in operations, and I started, you know, and if you um, if you put the time and attention into it, I think it can really make a huge difference in your stock price or your company valuation, how your employees perform. Because if they know they're working for a company that has a vision and is knows where it's going, it's a motivator. You're gonna get, you know, orders of magnitude performance more. And that all starts with knowing your message. So PR it's not just for the media. It's crystallizing your messages to all of your stakeholders. So I wouldn't really think of PR. I mean, if there's one thing that you guys leave the room with that I would want to convey, it's not looking at PR as getting out to the media only. It's really an orientation and a state of mind and a culture that you're building within your organization that will determine, in large part, I believe, your success or failure. Well, you know, thank you for your questions along the way, but are there any other questions at this point? Because if not, I'd like to thank Lauren and Lori. Well, I have one more question. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm not thanking you yet. That's not <laughs> <good. No. laughs> this is more for me, and it's off topic a little bit, but you know, you're, you're compliant that you live in the Valley. You used to live in the Bay Area back recently. Um, you live in the Bay Area now. You used to live here. And you always live here. Unless you're in Asia. Yeah. No, he's so we're all Hawaii people, but in different places. So, I mean, um, whether it's from a PR standpoint or non PR, what do you think of Hawaii as a place where technology companies can grow, you know, um, and, you know, compared to Silicon Valley counterparts? What are some things that uh, are advantages and what are some things that are challenges that? You know, we can, and how would we overcome that? Any comment on that? Because I think we're always interested in what we can do better. And, you know, and as far as the story, you know, maybe Hawaii is good, and maybe some ways it's not good. So, any comment on that? Yeah, you want to try that? One? Well, I was going to sidestep mm -hmm. that, like I said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, I think uh, it depends on the sector. You know, clean tech. I think in Hawaii, we. If, if not lead, we certainly are close to leading, uh, or at least being at par with the rest of the world. So I think clean tech, uh, we're doing good because of some of the infrastructure we have here. Um, although I think in other areas, it's really challenging for us because uh, in software, for example, that space moves so fast, and you know you could have direct changes, 90 degree changes in weeks. Um, and if being here in Hawaii, we don't see that sometimes. You know, we'll catch it on YouTube, we'll see it on the blogs, you know, eventually. But and that might mean that we're a month or two behind. So I think in that situation, in that world, software, mobile game de development and whatnot, I think you have to frankly be plugged in. You have to make trips, you have to have people that can keep you connected to what's going on in Silicon Valley because like it or not, that's where the critical mass is for that sector. And you know, in order for you to play, but do so from here you just have to know what's going on there. So that is a challenge. You have to get up earlier. You have to work harder here in Hawaii. Um, I think you can absolutely do those things, by the way, but it does require more of a commitment, I think, to do it here than there. Because you're there, if you're there, you're just going to be in the flow. So you know, there's events that happen every night. Uh, no kidding, every night there's something new and interesting happening. People are gathering. They're discussing things. You know, It's very easy to stay in kind of what's in vogue there. As opposed to here, you know, those events are not webcast. You know, they're not they're not on conference calls. You know, so it's harder it's harder to to stay up to speed. Uh, I think in that regard, but you know, work harder and you know, perhaps uh, you can you can do it. And I think we we work with companies all over the world, and a lot of them are in Silicon Valley, but a lot of them are in Moscow or Brazil, or you know, a lot of them tend to be kind of smaller communities where. There's a startup culture, but it's definitely not recognized the way that Silicon Valley is. And 
we always push these companies to make trips to San Francisco, to New York, to meet with reporters face to face, to build relationships, because I think that that's underestimated sometimes, the importance of, of just being there physically in person. And I know that's hard here, um, but I think I think just being able to to visit, to see what's going on, to be um, to be plugged in uh, and, and to meet people is, is a good way to, to get started. I think so. Just even if you're only, you know, if you can't afford all the time to be flying back and forth to Silicon Valley, even just meeting people here, I've, I've been amazed at how many people I've met here that have very strong connections to the venture community in Silicon Valley, or they were there. And so, you know, you might not be able to go yourself all the time, but, you know, maybe leveraging some of the um, people that are here. And you know the one thing, strength we have here, and probably why when I'm driving in the traffic every morning, I'm just crazy happy to be here, but <laughs> people here are, you know, we care about each other. We will go the extra mile for, for each other. And that is our strength, right? That's our strength. And, and so um, we have to leverage every strength we have when we have a geographic disadvantage, or we have a pool limitation in terms of Number, big, you know, the, the large, largest of our ecosystem, and we have to capitalize on strength. And I think that is the strength we have: is our culture of helping people. And so, I think that um, I think that there are a lot of us. I mean, I will help people if you want to call me. I mean, I'm kind of busy like the next week, uh, next month, but I will meet with you if you want, you know have a conversation. I'd love to meet. I always like to meet people, and I'm sure. It's not to offer your time up. <laughs> but um, yeah, so leveraging the people we do have here too, I think is really, really important. Well, you know, I'd like to thank Lauren and Lori and Darren. Uh, if we could give them a round of applause. <laughs> All of you for uh, participating in this. We were really, you know, Greg was in particular quite pleased with, with the turnout. Uh, so uh, thanks for that. And to, Greg, thank you for being the catalyst and uh, MIT, the host. Right, on behalf of the High Technology Development Corporation, we'd like to thank our, we'd like to thank our partnership with Greg Kim and Convergent Law. And for bringing us all of these esteemed panelists. Uh, we really did a great job. So I hope all of you go out there and get your PR going <laughs> and all of your startups to be successful. So thank you all for coming and please stay and talk story with them a little bit. Thank you. Boy, thank I have you. A, <laughs> I'd like to thank Sandy, HTDC, Mineral Innovation Center for providing the space, you know, free of charge, as a donation, and for all their help. We collaborated with them a lot. They're doing a lot of good. I'd like to thank my assistant, Kai, and Kathy Torco, recent grad from uh, Emerson Communications. She's going to write down your email addresses, if that's OK, so that you can hunt them down to get their help, <laughs> as you should do. Um, and you know, I think that um, you know these panelists, by the way, are not here because they need business. They're obviously busy people. I sort of corral them to do this. What they really want to do is help the community. And so that's really why they're here. And they've got good hearts, and so I think they're the kind of people you want to talk to and stay in touch with as your companies grow. So thank you again for coming. And you know, in, we're in the middle of the ocean. You know, the best products don't always win. If you don't get the products known, it's not going to happen. So you know, I think that's why this topic is really critical for Hawaii. So good luck on all your businesses, and we'll see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>